Hey, book by book. It's exciting to come to this thrilling study in John's Gospel. And today we come to study number six in our exciting series. We're sitting here in All Souls Church in Langham Place, London, England, but coming right by permission into your situation as we share in these studies. And I got with me Paul Blackham from Lancashire, but now living in London, and Anne Graham Lotz, our honoured guest from North Carolina, who's in Britain for just a few important and precious days. We're going to share this together, of course. And as we come to the study, it's John chapter 10, verse 22, from where we left off before, to right through to chapter 12. We've done already the themes of Jesus revealing the Father, teaching his friends, and working among those who needed his help, feeding, we were thinking of the feeding of the 5,000 and the bread and so forth, shining, we were thinking about last time. And now this time, we're coming on to dividing, dividing. And why don't I start? I think I'll take, first of all, chapter 11, just a few verses from verse 21. This is the account of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Oh, see, the jury is out in still some parts of the world today, isn't it, friends? And as we come now to this uh, little study, we'll give ourselves, I think, first of all, to Paul Blackham. Why does Jesus quote um, Psalm 82 to the unbelieving Jews in chapter 10, verse 34? Now we're going back a little bit, you see there, Paul. Yeah. It's because um, the, the, they've made it very clear that Jesus is saying, I am God. And then they sort of go, oh, well, that's just blasphemous, that you, a mere man, claim to be God. And then he's really, their whole view of God is completely mistaken because for them, God and humanity cannot be close at all. They're really distant. There's no intimacy, no real relationship at all. So he's really going to test the doctrine of God. And he goes back to Psalm 82, and it's a fantastic one for him to, to do because in that psalm, it begins by God stands in the middle of the assembly of Israel and gives judgment. And he really says, this is my work. My work is giving judgment, and that is pleading for widows, helping the orphans, uh, fighting against injustice. And I want you to do that. Instead of going for darkness and wickedness, I want you to be like me, to share my nature, to come close to me, to be in my life, to share my life. He says... I have called you God's Elohim. I've given you my name, my nature, my heart. But instead, you don't want that, and you'll, you'll just die like mere men and, and, and throw that away. So Jesus is really saying, mm -hmm. look, the destiny of Israel, of the people of God, is to be like God, to share his nature and his heart. And you're objecting the idea that I'm sort of claiming to be one with God. If you really understand Scripture, you'd understand that your, your understanding of God as God far away is totally mistaken. You wouldn't object if you understood what Scripture really taught. So it's a great, it's a great psalm for him to have referred to, if only as well because it talks about the darkness of, of the wicked who mm. turn away from what God offers. Mm. It says light and darkness again. again and in the Jesus song. is the pivotal factor in the whole of John's gospel. And so some will go with him and say, yes, 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 you are who you came to be. And others will say, no, you don't want him. Yeah. So uh, dividing, that is the theme. And then again, the same thing in a sense is happening in the death of Lazarus. Um, actually, how is Martha in this chapter, Anne? How is she a good example to us as Christian believers? Well, you know, she's such a good example from the very beginning of this story, really, because Lazarus, her brother, became very ill, and it must have been life-threatening, or we know it was. And she and her sister Mary sent word to Jesus that their brother was ill, and so really they were praying for him. And I think right there she's a good example, that she cared enough about her brother that she would pray and ask Jesus to intervene and to help. 
And I think for believers, sometimes we do many other things and we pray as a last resort, you know, and, and yet prayer is the first thing we ought to do to, to bring our loved ones before Jesus in prayer. In this case, he didn't answer her prayer right away. And so he delayed coming four days and in the meantime, her brother died. So when Jesus shows up on the scene four days later, she runs out and she's, she says, Lord, you know, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And in essence, she's saying, you're, you're late. You know, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why didn't you come sooner? If you'd come sooner, he wouldn't have died, but now he's dead, and what can we do about it? And so that's when Jesus has this wonderful exchange that you read uh, as we began, when uh, he says, she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died, but even now, I know he'll do what you ask. And that little but, you know, there's a glimmer of faith in Martha, but, but even now you can ask him to do something. So Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And she says, I know in the last day. And he says, but right now I am the resurrection of life. Do you believe this? And Martha said she did. The interesting thing, of course, is when Jesus took it from her just head knowledge and put it in the experience of her life and they stood at that empty or the tomb where Lazarus was buried. And he said, Martha, roll away the stone. And then it's like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, I said you were the resurrection of life, but I don't really believe it because he's been dead four days. If you roll that stone away, everybody will smell him. I'll be embarrassed. You know, I don't want you to be embarrassed. And Jesus looked at her and he reminded her of his word. And he said, Martha, didn't I tell you if you would believe that you would see the glory of God? I am the resurrection and the life. And so she had to put her faith in Jesus alone. And I think that's the key to this whole chapter, actually, that her faith was in nothing except Jesus alone. And then she rolled away the stone or had it rolled away. And Jesus, what a dramatic moment when everybody is silent because the stone has been rolled away. Mm -hmm. Look, it's this gaping hole mm -hmm. and the darkness and hear the word go forth, the same word that went forth in Genesis 1, let mm -hmm. there be light. The same word that called forth light from the darkness calls forth Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus comes mm -hmm. forth. That's dramatic. And so when Jesus has been claiming to be God, who else but God could raise the dead like that and bring Lazarus to life? Dramatic illustration that just, it's like the exclamation point to everything he's been saying. Do you think it's wonderful that Jesus doesn't say, hey, look, I can do miracles. I can, I, I can, do, I can do resurrections. He doesn't say that. He says, I am the resurrection, yeah, right. which is quite, quite different. Yes. So, yeah, Paul Blackham, uh, how do we see, as far as you can understand, the humanity and the divinity of Jesus in, in actually some great depth in this account of Lazarus? Well, it's, you, we see he's caught up in the whole situation and he weeps and he's deeply moved and there's his humanity, but I think that's his divinity as well. I mean, his divinity is there in the fact that only he can do this. He is the resurrection. He embodies the new life and everything. But I also think the fact that the, the quality of his emotion is also about his divinity. Mm -hmm. It's not as if his divinity doesn't care, but his humanity does. It's actually his divinity that cares. Because as human beings, we can be careless. And, and stand in front of death and tragedy and suffering and actually shrug our shoulders. Yes. We can do that. God can't do that. God isn't like that. He's not detached, sitting on a he pillar isn't. somewhere and saying, you know, oh dear, look at that. Look at that. But it doesn't bother me. It bothers him. And the, the, when he, he has that sort of deeply moved in verse 33, uh, in spirit, and he's troubled because there's death. And of course, for him, as the Lord of creation through whom everything came to be, death is such a personal violation. Mm -hmm. uh, much more, he feels it so intensely that in his good creation, that death, this alien intruder, comes in and causes pain and suffering and tragedy. And, he, and he, he's indignant against it. I think that shows his, his divinity. And I think Always, the, yes. the phrase in there where he was deeply moved, it actually means he's stirred and he's angry, You're doesn't right. it? And, I, and sometimes you stand at the grave of someone who's died and there is a reaction of anger. Yeah. And rather than feel guilty, I think many times it's a God-given yeah. emotion yeah. because death should never have been. He didn't create yeah. us to die. Yeah. He created us to live with him forever and enjoy him in a personal relationship. And death is the result of our sin. Yeah. And so I think at that grave of Lazarus, there was a deep anger against the temporary victory that death seemed to have yeah. over life. But he was promising that one day, you know, he would overcome and the grave would no longer have a sting and, and the tomb wouldn't have the victory, that he himself would be our victory over death and sin. 
it's a, a great vision, actually, to see Jesus there standing, defying the powers of darkness and, yes. and death, and weeping also in grief at there at the, at the graveside. And also the authority, if I can add that. I mean, the authority of Jesus is just stamped all over this chapter. Verse 39, take away the stone. Yes. That yeah. stone that, you know, symbolized all the sort of, uh, pre you know, preconceptions about death and the fears and the superstitions surrounding Jesus. Take it away. Yeah. Take away the stone. Verse 43, Lazarus, come out. Mm -hmm. And then verse 44, unbind him and let him go. Mm -hmm. And we think to ourselves, this is only the curtain raiser yeah. of the big thing. You know, unbind him and let him go. Go where? Oh, go back to the home of Bethany. It'll be lunchtime in a few minutes, you know. <laughs> and you're doing the washing up, Lazarus. And later on, you know, you better do your tax returns. You come back into the old life. Maybe but that's why Jesus wept. Because <laughs> he knew what he was bringing him back from. <laughs> yeah, he'd die again yeah. one day, go through the whole that's process. Right. <laughs> so this is only the curtain raiser to the big thing right. of Jesus' resurrection, yeah. which he shares then with all those who trust him around the world. Hey, we're thinking particularly of Mary and also Judas and the contrast between them in these chapters. What do we learn about true motivation from this episode, uh, Anne? You know, it's one of the most beautiful little scenes because this apparently was a banquet given in honor of Lazarus or maybe really in honor of Jesus who'd raised Lazarus from the dead, but it, but it was sort of the P.S. Yeah. to this um, experience in chapter 11. And all of these men had been gathered to celebrate the raising of Lazarus and to honor Jesus who had raised him. And during their dinner, while they were reclining around the table, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who actually didn't have much faith in chapter 11, she's there weeping uncontrollably, and, and Martha's the one that Jesus works through, but Mary was sort of uh, all undone. But in chapter 12, she slips into that dinner, and she brings the alabaster box filled with ointment that some feel was her dowry. It was her life savings put into that box. And she took that box, and she broke it, and she poured the contents out on Jesus, and in essence, giving him her future, giving him any hopes that she had of a, a marriage or a secure life, or uh, she just poured it out, all out on his feet. And he said, she's done this for my burial. I and mean, he honored her. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and so all of the disciples, everybody else were clueless that he was getting ready to go to the cross. And somehow with her woman's intuition, she sensed that he was getting ready to die and she wanted to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. And there is Judas, one of the hand-picked disciples, saying, why did she waste the ointment on Jesus? In other words, Jesus isn't worth it, Mary. You've just wasted your future, wasted your life, wasted your savings by giving it all to Jesus. And Jesus rebuked Judas and said that she had done this and that as long as his story would be told, as long as you tell big things like the cross and the resurrection, her story is going to be told. That's the way he honored this beautiful womanly thing that she did, but sacrificial as she poured out her whole future life at his feet, wanting to identify with him in his burial. And I think what a precious comfort to our Lord that one person, one human visible person, didn't really understand, but had an inkling of what he was getting ready to go through and wanted to be there for him and be a part of it. It's a beautiful story. It's, it's beautiful and it speaks right into today's world when you think of people who have given up so much, or appear to have given up so much for Jesus. But actually they've done it out of a full heart and it's worship. Well, and he says in here that the fragrance of her sacrifice filled the house. Mm. And I think when we pour out our lives for Jesus, and I can think of you in the ministry and many things that your family has had to give up. In, in a sense, you would be like your family's alabaster box and they would break you and give you all to Jesus so you can serve the people in this church. But the fragrance of their sacrifice permeates this church, permeates people beyond through this video series or your books and things. And it's a, it's the fragrance of a life that's poured out, but somebody's had to make the sacrifice to make that possible. And, and yet Jesus honors the person who makes the sacrifice. So we could say there's fragrances or to change the metaphor, there's ripples coming out from every life that loves Jesus. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Paul, I've got something here for you to ask you. I want to put to you about the significance of what Jesus was doing as he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, on uh, that Palm Sunday, as we've come to call it, and, and how the crowds reacted. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because he's... This has been prophesied that the Messiah would do this. Come in, the king of... of the real king, the ultimate king of Israel, would come to Jerusalem in this way. But the... Uh, and that, that's recorded for us there. But the, the crowd picked... Go to Psalm 118, 
in order to acknowledge this. Now, what's fabulous about that is that was a psalm which was almost like written for this very day, this official entry of the Messiah to Jerusalem. And it's, and O oh Lord, save us, verse 25 of Psalm 118. And they give a few um, selections from the end of that psalm. And the psalm is actually about going all the way up to the altar with palm trees, palm branches in hand, all the way up to the altar. Well, of course, Jesus is going to an altar. He is going to be sacrificed. And the psalm was kind of prophetically seeing that. Now, they don't go as far as that with the psalm. They give that little bit, and then they stop short of going the whole way to the bit where he goes right up to the altar to be a sacrifice. But the, the psalm actually ends with these words, you are my God and I will give thanks. You are my God and I will exalt you. The crowd actually stops short of saying that. They're prepared to say the Lord save us bit, but they don't go on to you are my God. But I think like John's saying, I invite you to go and have a look at where they're quoting from and finish off their quotations and you'll really understand what Jesus is doing on that day, even if the crowd didn't. And you see, we, on this theme of dividing, again, people were not believing. Just in a sec, we've only got a few seconds left, really, I think, in our program, but, Anne, again, we're still quoting from the Old Testament at the end of, towards the end of chapter 12, with Isaiah quoting there. And then it says, verse 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So we've had Moses earlier in our studies, uh, seeing Jesus' glory, Abraham, now Isaiah. I'd like to comment on that before we close. Well, that fabulous passage. Do you remember in Isaiah chapter 6 when he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he was referring to the Lord Jesus Christ that he saw. And it was at a moment of trauma in his life when Uzziah had died. And I think sometimes when traumas happen to us or tragedy or when we feel we're being shaken either personally or in the world or through our finances or our health, it's a time to look up. And it may mm. be at that very moment, God's wanting to give us a fresh vision of Jesus. Mm. He did to Isaiah in that year of trauma and, um, and he was beginning to reveal himself also to the people in a way that would leave no um, middle ground. Either you would believe and receive eternal life or you would reject and be condemned. I think it's wonderful that in different ways people have seen, like Isaiah did, in Isaiah 6, he sees Jesus, yeah. the, his glory. And as uh, John says in John 1 verse 14, we have beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You can be in your one room bed, sit on your own, and maybe, I don't know what kind of surroundings, but right there with a, you know, a drop of Coca-Cola in front of you and a Bible in your hand, you also, we together, see something of his glory. God bless you today, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, friends, very much indeed. <laughs>